Okay, dear attendants, welcome to the webinar Achondroplasia of the EPO study group Genetics and Metabolic Diseases. The EPO study group Genetics and Metabolic Diseases is one of the eight EPO study groups which you can find on the EPO's website. The EPO study group Genetics and Metabolics itself consists of an international group from, of experts from Centers for Rare Diseases in Pediatric Orthopedics from nine European countries. We would like to express special thanks for the support of this webinar by Biomarine. Know that Biomarine will have a special symposium at our EPOS 2021 meeting that you might find interesting. The moderators for the discussion of this webinar will be Deborah Eastwood from London and myself from Utrecht. The speakers will be in the following order. Wouter Nijhuis from the Netherlands, Karel Hassler from Basel, Switzerland, Joachim Horn from Oslo, Norway, Gabriel Mintler from Vienna, Austria, and Thomas Weert from Stuttgart, Germany. Questions can be asked from the faculty by using the questions function. At the end of the webinar, there will be 10 minutes for question and answers, in which the faculty will answer to the questions presented. If there is no time to answer to your question, you may email EPOS head office after the webinar, and your questions will be forwarded to the correct faculty member. And now I would like to introduce the first speaker, Wouter Nijhuis, on interdisciplinary care with life cycle planning for achondroplasia. Thank you, Ralph, for this uh, introduction. Um, the next 10 minutes I've, uh, uh, I will be presenting about interdisciplinary care and life cycle uh, planning for children with achondroplasia. Um, People with achondroplasia have uh, distinct uh, features that we all know. So they have got short stature, rhizomalia, frontal bossing, trident hands, virus deformity in lower legs, and all these different anatomical uh, changes affect uh, lots of parts of their lives. It affects actually all parts of their lives. Uh, people with achondroplasia are not just short people, but these are people with abilities and disabilities as well. And these abilities and disabilities might change over the course of time. So the International Classification for Functioning and uh, Disability, the ICF, which is based uh, on the uh, World Health Organization Assembly in 2001, came up with this picture to show the interaction between body function and structure and all the rest of the life uh, parts. So on the left side, you can see the body structure, which is obviously uh, altered by people with achondroplasia, and these alterations have effect on their activity, and this activity has effect on their participation as well, and combine those, they have effect of the general conception of health and condition. But not only these parts uh, affect the patient's uh, 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 feeling of well-being, it's personal factors and environmental factors as well. So for personal factors, you could uh, imagine that one person to another differ and that uh, the way you look at being short uh, might differ quite a lot from one person to the other. And environmental fact factors are more like cultural differences between countries or social uh, economical classes, uh, which all affect um, all these parts of life and they affect the total feeling of, be of well-being and health. So people with achondroplasia have challenges in different domains and uh, all these challenges they ask for an interdisciplinary approach since uh, all of us are uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeons. Most of us are not fitted to address all these problems in their clinics. Uh, so the best thing to do is uh, see not, do not see those patients alone, but see them with a specialized team, which should consist of an orthopedic surgeon, obviously, a rehab specialist, pediatricians, ear, nose and throat doctors, neurosurgery and physiotherapy. So this is an uh, overview of uh, the team of uh, for achondroplasia, which is uh, uh, in my hospital, in the uh, University Hospital uh, in Utrecht in the Netherlands. As you can see, we have for all departments two uh, physicians to make sure that during holiday leaves, uh, the clinic can just still run on. Uh, but uh, we don't 
only have orthopedic surgeons and rehab specialists. We also have social workers, occupational therapists, uh, psychology and data managers uh, uh, and research nurses, which are all important in care for um, achondral plasia patients. So if we decide to have an interdisciplinary care, there are different ways of organizing that. In our clinic, we've got a one-stop shop approach in which the patient comes to the clinic and they are seen by four or five doctors all at the same time in the same room. This has a major advantage of uh, sharing knowledge and uh, uh, clear communication uh, amongst the healthcare uh, uh, givers as well as to the patient. So they're all in the same room, so the explanation is clear for everybody who is there. Um, but there's a downside, it can be quite intimidating for especially uh, small children to face five doctors all at once. So there's different approaches possible as well. So you could think of a carousel um, in which uh, the patient is uh, uh, appointed to a room uh, together with his parents and the doctors will drop by one by one. It doesn't really matter how you organize it, I think it's important that it's organized and that you see these patients together. So. Um, there's a whole team needed for uh, achondroplasia patients, but the, uh, the team members they see might change during life cycle and time. So the, the, the demand for the different team members will change during each visit. So it all starts with prenatal screening. The gynecologist does his ultrasound and he noticed that there might be some rhizomalia. Perhaps they'll ask the clinical genetics and they'll do some research and then the, uh, the mother is not uh, pregnant of a child anymore, but she's pregnant of a child with achondroplasia. And this is a perfect time when, uh, uh, when this, is, uh, this knowledge is true with the parents to have a discussion by one of the expert team members with the parents, because there are lots of questions just after hearing the diagnosis about how the school will work, if they will be able to do sports in a normal way, if there will, have, will be a, a normal career possible, uh, and how to handle the child or a baby with achondroplasia. Uh, and all these questions uh, can be answered. You could appoint uh, the patient organization already that they can find other parents to, uh, to, to have contact with and to share their experiences. It helps a lot in the next upcoming um, clinics uh, just by having a chat during pregnancy. So then the, the, the child is born and uh, we tend to try to have these patients as soon as possible uh, to the neurologist or the neurosurgeon to see if they need, uh, if there is any foramen magnum uh, narrowing which needs uh, decompression. And afterwards we see them quite quickly uh, after birth by the physiotherapist to help the, patient, the parents with how to take care of a, uh, a baby with achondroplasia. After the first a couple of clinics, um, we see them every three months by physiotherapy and every six months with the physiotherapy, the orthopedic surgeon and the rehab specialist. And of course, there's a pediatrician involved for all sorts of different uh, issues that might occur. So the development in uh, people with achondroplasia is uh, uh, slightly different, but they have their milestones, they have their own milestones, and you could compare them amongst a bigger group of achondroplasia patients. As you can see on the right side in the small pictures, you can see there are different ways before, before they start crawling, uh, which is mainly caused by the fact that the head is bigger uh, compared to the rest of the body. On the left side you see a picture of a, of a baby, one of my patients, actually the other one is a patient as well, so they, they approved me using the, 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 the pictures. But you can see the, the muscles are not strong enough to keep the, right, the back stra straight and you can see a torcal lumbar kyphosis which is diminished by the older child. Uh, here you can see this in uh, this, the uh, uh, x-rays as well, there's a torcal lumbar uh, kyphosis, which diminishes at the age of four, but I'm sure Carl Hasler will tell more about this later on in the talks. Um, then all clinics are organized in the Netherlands uh, by parts of what they, what, uh, where they go to school. So at the age of four, people tend to go to kindergarten, and it's nice uh, uh, to have a chat then with a rehab specialist and social care services, and to make sure that the occupational therapist does understand uh, uh, what um, achondroplasia is and that you might not need all these adaptations that they're sometimes suggesting. So our motto is adapt to the world and don't adapt the world to achondroplasia. 
Then <clears throat> the next uh, visit will be around six when they when they go to primary school. Uh, normally, this is a good indication for uh, a guided growth, as I'm sure Gabriel Minder will uh, discuss later on in the talks. Um, and uh, this is a, a great moment to discuss how to cope with being smaller in primary school. Um, by then, the the children are really understanding that they are smaller and they will be having more troubles keeping up with their classmates so this is a, a good opportunity to talk to the parents about this and then at the age of 12 they need to prepare for secondary school they're all different issues such as uh, uh, how do i travel to school is the traveling too far do i need to carry heavy book weights and there are all practical uh, uh, adjustments and helps that you can offer to patients so then at the age of 14 they turn teenagers and then we have uh, a clinic in which the patient uh, or the econo patient person uh, are separated from the parents and the uh, social work has an uh, as a chat about uh, the letting go process uh, of patient uh, of uh, of children uh, with the parents and uh, um, the econo patient patient has a chat with the rehab specialist to discuss stuff uh, as discuss um, discuss the the, the the parts of life that you rather not discuss with a whole panel of five doctors such as social interaction relationships and sexuality for me as an orthopedic surgeon this is always the time to address the various angles and to say that there are possibilities for instance a uh, domo osteotomy to uh, help with the various angles and then they are turned 18 already and i think it's really important that after the children uh, reach the age of maturity that you transfer the care to an adult caregiver's team and we do that uh, in clinic in which uh, we see the patients together with the care adult caregiver and to make sure that everything that has passed during childhood uh, is transferred to the, 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 the adult team uh, and of course this is a great time to have a, a talk about career plans and, uh, and future planning. Then the other team takes over and they'll discuss further on uh, job and career opportunities. There will be later in life uh, questions about family planning and pregnancy. And of course, we educate the people uh, for the symptoms of lumbar stenosis to make sure that they uh, know who to go to uh, when they suffer from any problems and uh, who to contact if they have any questions. So, uh, on this topic of spine, uh, Professor Carl Hasler will uh, continue by his next talk, Spine and Acurum Replacia. I don't see my, my slides, although I have started. I can see your slides, Carol, but it's not in full screen mode yet. I don't I, see it. I can't stop my presentation because the, the button we used is not there. Where is it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 Walter, you should. Excuse me. Your... Walter, you should uh, close your webcam. Does anybody see my stuff? I can see your slides, but you're not on the full screen mode yet.
Carol, you're on mute now. Most of the numerous autoskeletal dysplasias. The region of interest are at the junction between the skull and the upper cervical spine in infancy. The thoracolumbar kyphosis also in infancy and uh, the lumbar part later in adolescence or in adulthood. To quote Jonathan Phillips from Orlando, Florida, the C-spine is guilty until proved innocent. Mm -hmm. Means that before it comes to an anesthesia, you have to rule out any pathology on this level. The anesthetists are confronted with uh, many challenges such as mid-phase hypoplasia and narrow nasopharynx, restrictive lung disease and obstructive sleep apnea. But above all, they are at risk to damage the spinal cord when they manipulate the neck during the intubation, when there is a stenosis at the level of the upper cervical spine. So you, as a, as a first treating doctor, you have to be aware of the symptoms which may be associated with a pathology at this level. Those are hypotonia, sleep disordered breathing, myelopathy, or even a sudden death. If you want to image it, uh, plain radiographs are not sufficient. CT scan is more helpful because it may show a stenosis at the level of the foramen magnum. But if you want to gather all the information, you have to perform an MRI to depict any cord myelomalacia, any cyst. And if you do, if you add some uh, flexion extension T2 weighted MRIs, you will even see that the CSF flow might be diminished at this level. Treatment over the last decade, decompression has widely replaced something, but the indication for decompression is still somehow controversial. It's clear if there is a clear stenosis in a symptomatic patient, but it's not so clear if you see MRI changes but the, the patient has no symptoms. There you might uh, observe the patient from for some period further. The most prevalent change uh, in an achondroplastic spine is a thoracolumbar kyphosis. Its prevalence is about 80%. Usually there are no neurologic symptoms. There is no pain, but there is a visible deformity and there is a lumbosacral hyperlodosis. The plain radiographs may show an anterior L1 wedging and, as I said, a junction, junctional kyphosis between the thoraco, uh, at the thoracolumbar uh, spine. So the natural history is, in most patients, relatively benign. We say that they walk away the curves, means if they start ambulating, also the kyphosis resolves. But there are some risk factors for progression of this curve. If there is a developmental delay, if they reach their milestones later, if they start sitting only after eight months, 10 months, or even later, if the kyphosis is more than 25 degrees, if there is strong apical vertebral translation, if there is a high percentage of wedging, as you see on the radiograph on the right side, and if the pelvic tilt is low. If we come to a therapy, observation is the, the therapy or the, the attitude of choice in most of the patients, and it's a viable option in non-ambulatory babies. If there is a, a severe kyphosis already at the beginning, with this, which is the exception, and if there is hypotonia uh, of the patient, you see that on the upper right radiograph with the big belly, which indicates that the muscle is not very strong, if this is the case, I discard unsupported seating or I give them a, a, a brace right at the beginning. Stronger uh, indications for bracing are a high degree of kyphosis. So if it's 30, 40 or more degrees, if it's still persistent or even progressive, even if the, the children ambulate already, we prescribe a custom TLSO, which should be uh, worn during the daytime. Usually, as I said, they walk away the curve, but the, the pattern may change. If you follow the x-rays from left to right, you see that at the beginning, it's a thoracolumbar classic kyphosis. 
then it resolves with ambulating and later on it comes back but at another level so the, the consequence of that is that you really have to follow up those patients even uh, in uh, in later childhood very rarely there is an indication for surgery if the the kyphosis doesn't resolve or if it's very severe as in the in the picture on the right side absolute indications are not published but uh, common indications are loss of sagittal balance, uh, back pain, or neurologic deficits. If it comes to an instrumented spinal fusion, we should avoid intracanal uh, implants like hooks or wires because the, the canal is so small that you might compromise the neurologic function. The last, uh, the last pathology is spinal stenosis as it occurs also in achondroblastic dogs like the dachshund. Usually it occurs in adults, but it may well appear also in, in later adolescence. Symptoms are incontinence, change of walking pattern, bag and leg pain, the well-known claudicotia as we know it from elderly patients with uh, stenosis, and the cramps usually improve when you, when you squat, when you bend over, or if you sit down. So, when you image those uh, spines with the CT scan mainly, you see the short pedicles, you see the short interpedicular distance, and you sometimes intraoperatively find also calcification of the ligamentum flavum, which contributes to the stenosis of the, of the canal. So operating is better early than, than later, it influences the outcome. And there are some technical in issues because there is virtually no space for the instruments uh, or rangers or anything else. So to decompress, it's better to use a bone scalpel or a drill, means make your way from outside the bone to inside the bone and avoid any manipulation within uh, the canal. And if your instrument, you have to consider the difficult, uh, different particular anatomy, mainly the short screw length. So you have to prepare that you might use a screw of two or 2.5 or three centimeters uh, which is not normal adult size for a lumbar spine. Complications, dural tears, of, of course, because there is limited space in the spinal canal. And if you uh, decompress four or five or more levels, you should uh, preventively fuse and instrument the spine. Otherwise, uh, you will face a, a progressive kyphosis for sure. So to conclude, you, uh, it's wise to involve the pediatric spine surgeon at an early moment because there are wide variations of the spine problems to focus on C-spine and it's not a mistake to make an early uh, lateral X-ray of the spine early in childhood, to be prepared for the difficult pathomorphology when it comes to operations and to be aware that the natural history is not always well-defined and we should observe and regularly follow up those patients. You will find all the key references in the talk and I now pass the word to Joachim Horn who you will focus on upper extremities. Good afternoon everyone. So my talk will be about the upper extremity and archondroplasia with a main focus on Humor lengthening. So in normal individuals, um, the fingertips reach to the level of the mid thighs. However, in achondroplasia, the fingertips reach only to the greater two countries. So the, the shortening is called the rhizomatic micromalia, which means the shortening is more severe in the proximal segments, which means the humerus and the femur. So shortening can create the disability in these patients and the difficulty to reach the top of the head or for perineum for hygiene care. If you look at the table, which is published by Merker, it shows the deviations of body proportions in achondroplasia compared with normal individuals. Note that boys age 18 years only have six centimeters less sitting height compared to normal individuals, but they have 64 centimeters less arm span, which means each arm is about um, 32 centimeters shorter than in normal individuals. So, and the disability from shortness may be exaggerated by flexion contractures of the elbows, which usually is caused by posterior bowing, which means the apex is posteriorly, of the distal humerus. They have, uh, uh, many of the patients have a dislocation of the radial head. The hands are short and broad, and the tickets are of equal length. That's why the hand is called a starfish hand 
and there is a typical separation between the middle and ring fingers. That's why it's called the trident hand. So this is the lengthening protocol, which we follow in Oslo. We do not usually recommend lengthening, but if there's a strong desire for limb lengthening in achondroplasia from the family and the patient, then we offer limb lengthening. Then we would start with lower leg limb uh, lengthening and axis correction at age eight, nine, and humor lengthening bilateral simultaneously at age 11. Then at age 12 and age 14, 15, lengthening with intermediary nails, where we start with the shorter precise nail, and then with a longer precise nail later on. So they gain a total standing height of uh, uh, 21 centimeters plus and the uh, arm length of eight centimeters. So why humor lengthening at age 11? This is because we need a certain uh, working length in the humerus between the growth plates in order to place our smallest fixator to auto fix a mini rail. You need a working length of at least uh, six centimeters if you use the two half pins, which are closest to the osteotomy, but we would recommend the working length of eight to 10 centimeters. That's why, that's why we would uh, do the first humor lengthening at age um, 11. Um, this is how we position the patient. Um, you have to make sure that you, with the reverse scope, can uh, see the a clenohumeral joint and the whole humerus. So you have to position the patient at the very edge of the operation table. And you have to make sure that the head is not moving too much. So you can see we use some tape in order to fixate the head to the to the operation table. And we use a, a wooden board, uh, which is a radiolucent um, in order to not have any metal um, under the arm. So make sure you create the um, uh, optimal uh, position of the patient before you start the surgery. Uh, we start with an anterolateral approach in order to develop the radial nerve. Um, you can see it on the right side. It's a, it's a short approach, but we make sure that we develop the brachioradialis muscle and the brachialis and biceps muscle. And in the spatium of the brachioradialis and brachialis, we would develop the radial nerve. Then we would temporarily close the wound and we would start to insert the first pin, which is um, as proximal as possible, but without injuring the proximal physis. Then we would um, use the fixator in order to place uh, pin number two, which is just proximal to the olecranon fossa. Now, then we would place the third pin, which is the middle pin in the proximal fragment. And the middle pin in the distal segment can be a little bit tricky because you have the recovatum deformity. As you can see on the uh, curvature of the humerus, if you put the pin where the yellow arrow is, you would not hit the bone properly. So then you have to detach the clamp from the fixator. You have to rotate the, the clamp to make sure you hit the bone properly with the second uh, pin in the middle. And we will always uh, open the, the incision again to make, um, uh, to make sure that we do not hit the radial nerve and we will watch the radial nerve when we put in the middle pins and the two distal pins. From the same incision, when we have placed all four pins from the same incision, we would perform the osteotomy just um, uh, below the, the tuberosita deltoidea. Um, we would first uh, perform some drill holes and then we would complete the osteotomy uh, with an osteotome. I show you start moving because after the holes, we insert the osteotome and then we rotate in order to create a fracture right there. This is called the osteoclasis technique in order to make sure that we see uh, sufficient bony healing during the lengthening. So be aware of the radial nerve when you do the osteotomy. Uh, when you place the Hohmann hook uh, behind the humerus, you, be, you would be very close to the radial nerve. And I show you a short video uh, which illustrates um, the proximity to the radial nerve. You can do this, it's far minutes. You can do it two or three times, but don't do it more often than this. Um, make sure the next day that um, the radial nerve is, um, is working as it should. So be aware that you do not compress the radial nerve um, uh, with the Hohmann hook um, when you perform the osteotomy. So when you have a recoatum deformity, and you use a straight uh, fixator after the osteotomy, you would align the bone. So you would create an 
acute correction of the requirement requ deformity, which means an anterior open wedge osteotomy. And um, then you would start the lengthening, and you can see on the right picture, now the patient is able to straighten his elbow. We start lengthening at uh, day five at a rate of uh, one millimeter a day, um, and we usually lengthen eight uh, centimeters. We use the Autofix uh, mini rail, um, which allows with the rail you can see on these pictures to lengthen 10 centimeters. Uh, but be aware after five centimeters of lengthening, you have to reattach the lengthening device uh, indicated by the yellow arrow. So then you just switch the hole to a more distal hole on the proximal clamp of the fixator. But you have to schedule your patients in order to uh, make sure you change the position and time so the patient can continue lengthening. The postoperative care includes the outpatient visits uh, every second week you're lengthening, unrestricted range of uh, motion and passive movements, physiotherapy and, and home exercises, and the external fixator is removed when you have a three solid uh, cortices on AP and lateral radiographs. After removal, we would uh, not allow for, to bear load with the arm for eight weeks and no sports for 12 weeks. No plastic cast. The results, you see here an example of uh, on the left picture after two centimeters of lengthening, on the right side after eight centimeters of lengthening. This lady, she was also in a, in a TV program in Norway. I have the permission to show the pictures. So this shows her function after lengthening. She's very good in shooting and even climbing and other sports. Another example on the left side before lengthening on the right side after eight centimeters of lengthening. So you see here on the left side, a picture of a uh, achondroplasia patient who was not lengthened. So the fingertips, they reach to the counter uh, region after lengthening, the fingertips reach to the middle of the tie. And he uh, had, has also done the lengthening and axis correction in the tibia. And he's uh, scheduled for lengthening the femur. So, however, does it help? Does humor lengthening improve function? And does it improve uh, quality of life? So this is not a complete review of the literature, but you can see um, the mean values and totals and percentage. Um, um, and you see this is 342 segments. So the length gain in all these publications was 85 millimeters, which is quite a lot. The lengthening index was quite good to 26 days uh, with the frame on per centimeter of lengthening and very few complications. So. I think we can say technically it's not a problem to do lengthening the achondroplasia in the humerus and not in the femur and tibia either, um, with very few complications. However, very few papers report patient-related outcomes. Um, the DASH is reported, the Rosenberg uh, self-esteem and the SF36, uh, but I think there's a, a lack of patient-related outcome measures um, in most of these complications. So we cannot really tell if humor lengthening improves uh, function in most of the patients. There's an indication from uh, several publications that it does, but I still think there's um, a lack of uh, really good indication to do the surgery. So should we do humor lengthening? You see here a typical patient uh, with uh, uh, kyphosis with uh, probably a radial head uh, subluxation with a uh, flexion contraction in the elbow. Um, so, but most of the achondroplasia patients then know how to help themselves. But um, I think in the latest talk today, we will discuss the uh, indications for surgery and uh, the outcomes in these patients in terms of quality of life. So, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Gabriel Mindler from Vienna in Austria. And the topic is uh, low extremity and our contemplation. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. I will talk on lower limbs in a contemplation. I have nothing to disclose. I work at the orthopedic hospital in Vienna, Speising in Austria, and um, I'm part of the deformity team of the Department of Pediatric Orthopedics 
uh, together with uh, Rudi Ganger and Christoph Radler, I take care of our patients with rare uh, bone diseases. And uh, the picture size uh, shows you how relevant I am compared to these guys. With a multidisciplinary approach, which, which is very important, uh, we are part of the Vienna Bone and Growth Center and together with three other uh, mm -hmm. institutes, we take care of our patients with achondroplasia and other rare bone diseases. I want, today I want to talk about gates and deformity, lower limb deformity. We will talk about the hip. I will focus on the knee and we will uh, see some examples for deformity correction. So the gait in achondroplasia often already shows the most important part of deformity in lower limbs. So we often see virus deformity of the legs. We see uh, intoing uh, with uh, an internal foot progression angle. These uh, disease-specific uh, changes have been reported in uh, children as well as in adults. The hip is sometimes important for the initial diagnosis. Uh, we do uh, in Austria we do ultrasound according to calf, and sometimes uh, we can find uh, typical changes. Uh, we have a beard sonography in these uh, patients because we cannot do uh, the normal uh, ultrasound. Uh, we cannot measure the alpha angle. We see a very flat acetabulum, uh, and again we don't find the correct points for our alpha angle. This has been reported by uh, De Pellegrin, and in this case. Uh, we found uh, some typical changes uh, clinically as well as uh, in the lower limb radiograph. With 12 months, uh, the same patient, we can uh, see uh, this uh, wide metaphysis. Uh, we see the pelvic configuration as well as a flat acetabulum. The knee in achondroplasia is a very interesting uh, topic. We uh, can talk about uh, the discrete meniscus, which is uh, often uh, a case in a painful knee in a contraplasia and some good results of uh, arthroscopic repair have been reported. Uh, very interesting is uh, this study showing uh, the path pathology within the knee. Uh, and in this study, they found uh, in all cases of contraplasia uh, a very deep trochlea. They found a high intercondylar notch and a vertical ACL, a vertical aligned ACL, and furthermore, uh, nearly in all cases, uh, cases a discrete meniscus. We always have to do a deformity analysis uh, and uh, can plan our uh, deformity correction for our surgery. But we have to keep in mind that the analysis of the lower limb in uh, chondroplasia is more difficult, especially in the tibia and especially in patients younger than six years. And we have to check for deformity in frontal, in sagittal, and in a transverse plane. Uh, an example for the sagittal plane is the tibial slope, which um, we have to check in these patients if there is hyperextension of the knee and the uh, increased PPTA angle, then we have to uh, consider to um, correct this uh, deformity. So this is a patient uh, example of a seven-year-old girl, and we did uh, find this hyper uh, hyperextension and the increased PPTA. We did a lengthening uh, with a Taylor spatial frame, and during the lengthening, simultaneously we corrected uh, the um, tibial slope. But uh, don't treat the radiograph; uh, always treat the clinical hyperextension. What other options do we have for bony deformity correction? We can use guided growth, which was mentioned before. We have, we have the option of osteotomies, uh, external fixators, and intramedullary nails. For guided growth, uh, some re um, good results have been reported. However, it was mentioned before, we need to start early, and uh, osteotomies might still be necessary. So I want to show you three cases uh, for guided growth. And we already heard we have to start earlier, so I'll show you some late um, cases. And this 10-year-old uh, boy with a contraplasia with a virus deformity, um, we did a PD plate on the proximal lateral tibia, and we waited five years uh, for uh, the uh, correction of uh, this virus deformity. So we, we really need growth, and we really have to start early in a contraplasia. This next patient. 12 years and a girl uh, in uh, and a chondroplasia. We had a more severe virus deformity 
Again, minimally invasive option is guided growth. Uh, and three years postoperatively, we have an incomplete correction on the right side, uh, and the left side was OK. And this uh, last case, a 14-year-old um, boy with a mild uh, virus deformity. Uh, we were quite late with our uh, guided growth. Uh, and uh, we see the spreading of the um, screws. So there was growth. However, there was no correction of the um, virus deformity. And uh, we can further uh, note that there is uh, internal tors torsion of the foot. So we cannot correct maltorsion with uh, a guided growth. If we want to correct maltorsion, then we have to do an osteotomy. An example uh, for this is uh, an osteotomy and tailored spatial frame uh, lengthening. Uh, so in this five-year-old boy, we did um, illateral uh, lengthening and deformity correction. And uh, we see a uh, good uh, correction of the torsion and uh, as well as a uh, good correction of the uh, virus deformity and uh, lengthening. This patient was uh, clinically very active uh, with this frame configuration and was happy with this final outcome. If we have a more severe deformity, if there is a virus deformity of the ankle of the distal tibia, then we might um, use a B-level TSF. Uh, this is a clinical example for, with uh, two osteotomies to address uh, the, the complex deformity and this pre and post -op clinical picture. Another option is uh, our unilateral fixators on the femur. Which, are, um, which allow bilateral lengthening, as well as uh, the use uh, for lengthening, in, especially in obese uh, patients, which is sometimes the case in a controplasia. And we can also do some deformity correction uh, with this uh, technique. We can combine these uh, techniques, uh, unilateral and circular fixator. And of course, we have intramedullary lengthening nails. We heard about this. The bone size uh, is a big issue in this case. And again, for deformity correction, in my opinion, it's more of a lengthening device in, uh, in a contraplasia. But it's, uh, not, of course, it's a nice option uh, to do the lengthening. The joint instability uh, is a very important topic in a contraplasia. Uh, check the AP x-ray and you will see an increased JLCA uh, that means a sign of uh, collateral, uh, lateral collateral ligament um, instability or over length. And we can uh, do a distalization of the fibula head to uh, tighten uh, the um, lateral collateral ligament. Uh, and uh, this has been reported, sorry, this has been reported in studies before. In this case, we used uh, again a TSF and did lengthening virus correction and we did the distalization of the fibula head. So this was preoperatively, uh, yes, and this is postoperatively. The head is um, more distal and uh, the collateral, the lateral collateral ligament is tightened. The ankle is a very important topic, but today, uh, unfortunately, not enough time to, take to discuss this. Our patients uh, with fixators are very active, uh, outdoors as well as indoors. Uh, sometimes they are a bit too active. After frame removal, uh, if you apply a cast, they are still active. And again, sometimes they are a bit too active, but um, this is most important. They are active after surgery and they can do their um, favorite activities. And this is the final and the most important outcome for us. Thank you very much for your attention. And our next speaker is Professor Wirt, and he will talk on uh, lengthening in a contraplasia.
So my topic is lengthening for short stature and achondroplasia, pros and cons. The clinical problems have been well described, disproportionate rhizomelic short stature with an expected body height uh, average uh, 136 centimeter and a range of 120 and 148 centimeters. We have axial deformities of the lower limbs and in um, Germany, um, a height under 140 centimeter qualifies for um, disability uh, passes. Now, do we really know that um, height uh, impacts on quality of life? It's not clear because there are several studies um, with different um, um, results. Um, this study for Rohn Cole says the better the attitude towards the height, of, the attitude of the poor to the patient towards his height, the better the patient's rating of quality of life. That means that characteristics such, such as height appear less important for the self-perceived um, quality of life and strength and um, difficulties and protective uh, psychosocial um, factors. Um, another study um, recently um, um, published comes to a different conclusion. They wanted to assess if height had an impact on quality of life and clearly stated in different patients with skeletal dysplasias that um, uh, their results suggest that height in and of itself is a factor in quality of life. The sample size was small, but still um, the results were quite clear. With regards to self-esteem and quality of life, we usually refer to the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, and we can see in a comparison with achondroplastic patients and their first degree relatives without achondroplasia, that the um, self-esteem is higher in the patient not affected. Now, when we look at our uh, orthopedic problems, um, we basically have um, axial deformities such as uh, genera vera, including torsional um, um, malalignment, and they are coming for axial corrections plus or minus lengthening depending on their wish. We can do this as said with, in, with different uh, methods. And the other um, big issue is small stature. There are several treatment options. One is lower extremity lengthening, but that's not the only possibility. Um, growth hormone um, treatment um, has, uh, at least in some study, um, shown quite um, uh, 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 quite uh, um, acceptable height gain, uh, such as in this um, um, Japanese study where they found uh, 3.5 centimeters in male and 2.8 centimeters in female. And if you compare this treatment with um, lengthening procedures of the tibia and femur, you can gain quite a significant increase of height. Now, very, very new is this article on uh, a phase three study of the Vosorytide uh, therapy. That's the C-type natriuretic peptide, which um, is uh, uh, has shown in animal uh, in animal studies quite an in significant increase of um, length of the length of the bones. Now they found that um, there was a 1.57 centimeter uh, per year increase um, compared to the placebo group if uh, vosorytide was used. Um, so this is a, this is more uh, probably um, or possibly the new incoming treatment. When we plan lengthening in uh, achondroplastic patients, um, the multiplier method adjusted to achondroplasia can be um, used very um, um, successfully because it uh, allows us to compare the height of an um, achondroplastic patient at, um, at a certain age to the normal height um, and uh, then shows us which timing for uh, uh, lengthening procedures can be um, the, the best for the individual patient. Our lengthening strat strategies mostly aim for proportioning the extremities and the body and to achieve a body height greater than 140 centimeters. Now, which strategies could we use theoretically? The all-in-one strategy, all four bones in one session, or unilateral, but that create, this creates significant link length inequalities, or cross leg, so femur and tibia of the of different sides. 
but the most used and the most logic uh, version is the transverse parallel um, lengthening strategy where you use both femurs or both tibia at one time and um, you also have to uh, plan by um, giving the patient a schedule um, we can tr uh, try to use the planning according to Peretti who started age five with tibia and six with a femur many others uh, have decided to even start earlier and you must select the strategy um, and then um, schedule mostly two to four lengthenings to, uh, to uh, uh, achieve your goal. We must all be aware that these procedures are, um, do have complications. Are, the different studies are hardly comparable, but um, there are one, uh, 0.4 to 2.0 um, per patient. Um, so that's quite a significant number. We've heard about the usefulness of upper extremity lengthening and the patients I know, they uh, really are, ex uh, they find this lengthening, the gain of eight centimeters of upper limb length, length uh, extremely helpful. Now, but um, when we compare the assessment of quality of life between the patient and their parents, we get quite interesting rates, uh, ratings because the parents always rate lower. So when we decide on um, lengthening a patient, um, we can ask the questions: uh, Who are we do? Are we, who are we really lengthening? Who, uh, are we lengthening the bones of the child just to make the parents happy? So when we decide on a first lengthening at an early age, let me like in this page, age six years, it is solely solely the parents' decision to lengthen the patient. But if we start much later and come up with the first lengthening, like in this case at age twelve. It's clearly a patient's decision with a parental guidance. Um, so a much, much uh, uh, better uh, a choice because the patient himself uh, um, has uh, uh, given us his uh, um, wishes and we know what he wants. Um, it is not so clear as we all think that um, uh, after limb lengthening, patients do show a better qu uh, quality of life rating. In this comparative study, only the self-esteem score of Rosenberg performed better in the patient's group who had surgery. In another Japanese study, um, you can see that um, patients who um, uh, gained heights beyond 140 centimeters showed similar uh, health-related quality of life measures with a short form 36 um, to normal patients. And the shorter the patient was, the lower the score was. So there is some relation. We have all heard about our new modern implants and intramedullar lengthening devices allow much more comfortable treatments and possibly a higher lengthening frequency uh, between the sessions like in this patient, um, with, uh, two lengthening sessions in a relatively short period of time and uh, uh, possibly a lower complication rate. So. Lengthening pros and cons. Pros, raise lower self-esteem, better quality of life of patients taller than 140 centimeters, proportionizing and lengthening, more comfortable lengthening devices for older patients are available, and later starts allow consideration of patients' views. Cons, high surgical complication rate, parents' decision-making if early lengthening is uh, requested, other medical treatment options may also lead to satisfactory gain of height and need to be considered. Um, so in conclusion, there are no widely accepted recommendations and individualized approach is advisable. And the arguments of those patients who decided uh, uh, for a lengthening procedure refer, refer to facilitating the activities of daily living. Thank you very much. So thank you all for these wonderful presentations. Uh, we have come to some time for discussion. Uh, there are a few questions. I think I will uh, take the most important ones and the rest will be sent to you. Uh, one important question was um, if patients uh, if uh, patients with achondroplasia are born, if there is a uh, uh, should we screen them all on uh, cervical stenosis or just 
uh, on uh, with symptoms. It was a question for Carol Hustler. Hello, Carol. Can you discuss on that one? You're still muted. Carol? Now I got you back. Maybe it was a question to me. If you, if I may ask you to repeat it because I, I didn't hear you. The question is if all children should be screened for a cervical stenosis after birth or what information the patients should get after birth. Uh, I mean, that there are. Uh, I got it. There are some clear indications for the MRI, of course, when the, there is a symptomatic patient, or uh, I would cancel it, uh, recommend it also before any intubation, uh, that it's clear if there is an anesthesia and you need to manipulate the cervical spine, you need to do it. In, in the most recent papers in, in, in literature, it's recommended because they found about 50% of all patients had a, or showed a stenosis. Uh, in an MRI, which was done at an early stage. So the current indications are obviously uh, that more and more centers are doing MRIs within the, the first year of life to uh, to display any, any uh, stenosis. And the question then is, if you find a stenosis without my, myelopathy, if you if you perform surgery, do you de to decompress it and have you cancel the the parents and uh, the families uh, how to proceed and this is really uh, this is open to, to debate. It's clear if there is a myopathic sign if the patient shows some sleep apnea etc etc you, you need to proceed with neurosurgery but if you have a completely asymptomatic uh, baby with a slight stenosis I think most of us uh, would wait would wait and see. Okay thank you. Yeah, Deborah, you want to ask some questions? Yes, I was just going to add a sort of yes or no, maybe from Vuta and Carol. I was a little horrified to find that our local uh, maternity unit would counsel for sudden death, you know, before the family take the baby home and sort of say that their baby might die overnight. The way the family phrased it to me looked a little bit dramatic. So I was just wondering if that was normal practice. To be honest, I don't see the patients at that early stage. Usually, yeah. I'm, I'm involved, uh, involved much later. But uh, from a common sense, <laughs> I, I wouldn't do that. I mean, you you can scare the parents about any risk in life, and you could you could have a, a list of thousand uh, issues. So uh, I think it's time to talk about the C-spine issues uh, at a later stage, but not immediately after birth, and send them home with a uh, uh, be being awake all night to, to watch the baby and observe it. I, I, I wouldn't recommend that. Good, good, good. To, okay. do, do not underestimate the, uh, the influence of social media. So lots of these patients do address this issue because they've heard of a patient somewhere uh, having sudden death. And in that case, you should uh, explain what to look for and to be very careful in your explanation. And of course, when uh, they, they should be worried and go to uh, to see a doctor for, uh, for to see if there's any decompression needed, as Carl Hasler already explained. But um, uh, even though if you don't address the, the fact of the sudden death, there might be an issue uh, amongst the patients themselves uh, due to social media. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Okay, then another question also for Carol. If there is any uh, prevention in early treating before working with braces, uh, is a question from the audience. Well, there's a contradiction in that. Either it's a preventive measure if there is no kyphosis at the beginning, or you have a kyphosis and you treat it. Uh, if there is no kyphosis at all, I wouldn't treat it because uh, usually it's a benign condition and they walk it away. If there is a kyphosis uh, over 25 to 30 degrees and I see when the pa patients are reaching their milestones with sitting and I see that they are not able to control their, their spines, they're hypotonic and uh, kyphosis increases in the upright position, I usually give a brace. Although I have to be honest, there is not a lot of evidence about that, but it's a a simple measure to do it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question from the audience. Um, is, um, is there any, uh, uh, um, it, it's to Joachim Horn for the upper extremity, 
uh, do you see for the future uh, more patient-friendly methods of lengthening of the humerus, for example, by internal plates or uh, intermediary lengthening? No, I don't think so, um, Ralph, because the, as I showed, the, the working length of the humerus at age 11 is around 10, 11 centimeters between the growth plates. Plus, the, you have a recovatum deformity. So I think it will be very difficult to to insert a nail in this bone. And I, I don't see the point to use a nail because um, you have to go through the rotator cuff. It's very easy to lengthen with the external fixator. So I think um, external fixator is the perfect um, uh, instrument to do lengthening our contemplation, probably the only one in a patient who is not lengthened beforehand. If you have a, a patient who is lengthened already, you might uh, use a nail, but in in the first length thing, I, I don't see a point to use a, use a nail in the humerus. And Joachim, would you ever just correct the deformity with the plates, you know, and improve their functional range of movement, or do you feel that that's not really enough of a, a, of a treatment? No, I think that's not enough. We haven't done this. Um, they have, not all patients have a flexion contracture, yeah. but most of the patients have. I think um, to treat a flexion contracture alone with a plate, it's probably a little bit risky because the humerus is short, the nerve is everywhere. So using a plate, you might risk to hurt the nerve, or at least you have a nephropraxia. So no, we haven't done this, and I, I can't see if, if there's an indication for that. Right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and a question for Gabriel Mintler for the lower limb uh, from the audience. Is it worth considering treatment for fibular overgrowth before the growth end by epiphysiodesis? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's worth to consider it. Uh, however, I wouldn't recommend it as a prophylactic uh, measure because uh, uh, first of all, we, it's difficult to um, uh, to calculate the growth uh, of the proximal fibula in uh, contraplasia, and furthermore, not all uh, patients do have uh, problems with an overlength of the lateral collateral ligament, uh, which makes it hard to decide uh, which patient needs to be treated. Okay, thank you very much. Um, to all of you, there are apparently many different protocols for lengthening. I think it's very hard to give a general advice on the protocol which one should use. Is that correct? It's very personalized and it's also different per hospital. Does everyone uh, agree? Uh, there was one question, what is the general protocol for lengthening in achondroplasia? I don't yeah, think the, that the, answer, the answer is there is no protocol. Exactly. Yeah. I just think okay. you know, Thomas made a very important point, which one is that the, the patient has to be at an age where he can contribute to the decision um, whether to lengthening or not. And the other thing is, if you do the lengthening very early, uh, you would inhibit the natural growth. So I think you should postpone the lengthening at least until age nine or even 10. So um, usually we do the deformity correction in the tibia with some lengthening at age nine, but the femoral lengthening not before 12 age 12 or 14. And can, we, and can we agree that just because you start on the lengthening program doesn't mean you have to complete it? So if, if after one or two treatments you've had enough, then that's enough. I agree, Deborah. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. And that's, that, therefore it is very important that you select a treatment protocol which allows stopping lengthenings mm -hmm and doesn't force you to another surgery which the patient or, or, or doesn't want so that's therefore it's very important to buy, to go on bilaterally um and not cross leg for instance and things like that okay one question for carl hustler about cervical spine and sports activities do you screen for special sport activities or do you uh, advise patients to do uh, not to do some sports because they're a high risk? Well, it's the same discussion as we face in uh, Down syndrome patients. And uh, I think more, more and more of those patients that are involved in, in some sports activities, uh, at least in, uh, in Switzerland. So if they start doing it, I would recommend it. In, in Switzerland, a lot, many of those patients, they... Oh, I cannot hear you again. It's muted.
Carol, we've lost you. Okay. Carol, we, we missed the last part of your comment because we can, couldn't hear you. Yeah, somehow the, the acoustics also in the other direction interrupts all the time. Uh, what was my last uh, word? What did, I, did you stop hearing me? Um, uh, you made some general recommendations about sports, told us that more, more and more people get involved in sports and then we lost you. Yeah, and then I, I made the transition to skiing in Switzerland, which is, has become a high velocity uh, sports and high risk sports. So usually I, I recommend it to the patients to do that if they become active, because it's, it's uh, very easy to have uh, uh, some MRI cuts at the upper cervical spine and uh, it's worth doing it and it's not compared to what can happen, what consequences there are. Okay. Sonny, you, you tell us when the seminar webinar ends because we have more questions to go. I think we can still go for a few more minutes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, question from, I cannot read fully, the colleague Jean Pimenta, after lower lengthening, do you see lower rates of comorbidities? Sonny, you have to add on that because then it ends. Question in my screen. Can you tell me from whom it is? And then I can read it. Jean Pimenta. Jean uh, Pimenta. Yes. After low limb lengthening, do you see lower rates of comorbidities such as lumbar spinal stenosis, spinal claudication in later life? Question for Gabriel or Thomas? relationship between length I, I and can't length. reply because i don't know my feeling is that um these are different things not linked to each other and i wouldn't say that the spinal stenosis rate is lower after limb lengthening but okay. I, I totally don't agree know. i'm not aware of this okay thank you one question from deborah should we be using prompts maybe you can add something to that deborah uh, not really. Um, I was just, you know, I think it, it's very, it's a very a common theme in pediatric orthopedics at the moment that we should be thinking about quality of life more than radiographic appearances. And yeah, I, certainly in our hospital, we're we're poor at collecting um, patient reported outcomes. Uh, and I don't know why we can't just get into the habit of doing it much more routinely on the cases, certainly on the cases we operate on, for example. Um, so I'm just hoping, wondering if anyone's better at it than we are. Uh, any comments from the others? I think, we, I think we should. Uh, we like doing it and uh, we are the work of, uh, of initiating it, but it's definitely a weakness in pediatric orthopedics. I think I can agree on that one. We still we also working on it, uh, Walter. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. But we try to get it implemented into our electronic patient dossier file. To have so yeah, we, we we did a great uh, a big international uh, um, a project on uh, uh, PROMS uh, and outcome measurements in OI actually, which is a different disease, but uh, it yielded a a set of comprehensive uh, tools that we are going to implement in all of our skeletal dysplasia patients. Uh, so we're working on it to, to get it professionalized. So there are prompts uh, being done in our clinic, but it can always be better. And I think Deborah is completely right. That is a really important and it's the way to go for the next coming years. Well, I think that is a nice topic to end this webinar. I would like to thank all the attendants first, of course the speakers, but most importantly the attendants to, sh to show up. And uh, we, we had very much uh, fun in doing this. Uh, and I would really thank Sunny Hiltunen, our without this wouldn't have been possible from the EPOS Central Office. Thank you very much all. And with this, I would like to end the webinar on a condroplasia.
And a special thanks again to Bayern Marine for the support. Thank you and good afternoon.